Please be seated. The text for the sermon this day is taken from that gospel lesson, which was read to you a little bit ago. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Caiaphas now has his case, so to speak, his case against Jesus. He has convicted Jesus of committing blasphemy on account of claiming to be the Christ, the Son of God. And the punishment for that under Jewish law would be death. But the problem is, is that Caiaphas, or Caiaphas I should say the problem, is that he could not carry this out. He did not have the authority to execute Jesus. He needed that authority from Pilate. This is why it says, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. The reason being that only a few months prior to this trial, so this trial happened in April of 33 AD, a few months prior to this, Pilate ordered a decree that stated that the Jews could not execute anyone without the authority of the Roman prefect. So that's why they have to come to him. But Pilate knows there is no case. He knows that Jesus is innocent. He knows that they had brought him there out of jealousy primarily, because he had gained so much fame, so much popularity, and they didn't have that. But he was in a very, very difficult situation. And warning, you're going to be, I don't know if this is warning or not, but you're going to get quite the history lesson here. So Pilate was appointed to be the prefect of Judea by a man named Sejanus. Now that's an important thing to remember. We're going to come back to that person, Sejanus. When he was appointed by, to that role, it was most definitely not without difficulties. First and foremost, you had Herod. King Herod happened to be in charge of Galilee, but he wanted more than Galilee, he also wanted Pilate's area. And so he would come up with clever little ways to try to get Pilate to lose his power so that he could take it. For example, there was a situation where Pilate put, on, put forth these medallions on the outside of the palace, and on it had the name Tiberius Caesar. Well... Herod saw this as an opportunity to stir up the crowd, and he did. And his plan was, was whatever Pilate did, he was going to write a letter to Tiberius. If Pilate took it down, he was going to send a letter saying, Dear Tiberius Caesar, your prefect is not loyal to you. He has taken down your medallion with your name on it. If he leaves it up there, Herod's going to incite a riot, in which Pilate is going to have to squash, and then Herod is going to send a letter saying, Dear Tiberius Caesar, your Roman prefect does not know how to govern these people. He will not take these down. Pilate chose to keep up the medallions. Herod sent the letter, and Tiberius responded saying, Take those stupid things down. And so, he's already dealing with that. Which, by the way, this is why in the Gospel of Luke, it tells you that they were at enmity with one another up to the date of that trial, because they were constantly scheming. But there is other situations. For example, there is a situation where he put, put up these shields that had the image of Tiberius Caesar, which, if you know about Jewish culture, you were not to have the image of anyone especially not a foreign governor, foreign ruler. And so when they saw this, there was a riot. 
a riot that Pilate had to squash in a very violent method. There's another circumstance where Pilate had built an aqueduct. In order to build this aqueduct, which, you know, is a good thing to have. Jerusalem needs good water. But the problem was, is how he paid for it. He used funds from the temple treasury. To give you perspective, it would be if the, like the city of Ida Grove needed repairs on the water tower, and they decided to take it from the St. Paul Lutheran Church account. You could imagine there'd be some very angry people. And so there was a huge riot again. And Jesus even talks about this when he talks about the blood that Pilate had spilled. But the thing is, is after that happened, Tiberius sent a letter again to Pilate. And this was actually only a few months prior to the trial of Jesus. If there is one more issue in Jerusalem, your, your usefulness in Judea will be expired. Which is a simple way is, get things in order or you will, it will be your head. And to make things even a little bit more complicated, remember that guy named Sejanus? The guy that appointed Pilate? Well, in October of 32 AD, he was found guilty of treason, of trying to overthrow Tiberius Caesar. The consequence was that he was executed, along with his family, along with his friends. And anybody who had any association with Sejanus was held in question, including Pontius Pilate. Which is why, we didn't get to it, but in chapter 19, the crowds will say a line and say, you are no friend of Caesar's if you let this man go. That was a threat. That they would send a nasty letter to Tiberius saying, he has betrayed you. Get the situation that Pilate's in? And he knows that he should let Jesus go. I mean, The thing that makes it even harder is in the Gospel of Matthew, it tells you that his wife had a bad dream on account of Jesus. And Roman rulers have a reason to be afraid of that. Because again, a little bit of history lesson, when Julius Caesar was assassinated, his wife, the night before, had a nightmare concerning him and told him not to go to the marketplace. He did not listen to her. He was assassinated. That's why Roman rulers were very suspicious, very superstitious when it came to dreams. So he is in this situation of either he's dead, he is executed or he has Jesus killed. This is why he is trying any and every scheme he can to get Jesus to go free. That's why he had Jesus flogged and they figured... Look at how badly he's beaten. You've got to let him go now. He offered up to them Barabbas, a man who historically was an absolutely reprehensible person. It's like there's no way they picked Barabbas over Jesus. Guess they proved him wrong. They picked him. The very fact that they even said, we have no king but Caesar, which they'll say, they say in the next chapter, shows how badly they wanted Jesus dead. Because if you read about Caesar Tiberius, he was not a model person at all. But the thing is, so I, I go through all of this, and there's a reason. First reason is, I don't know if you noticed, I'm bringing a lot of this historical data, information that's taken from like the likes of Tacitus, Josephus, all these historical writers, as a wonderful reminder that everything you read in the Gospels is fact, history. It really happened. All of these external events explain a lot of the things that happened in the Gospels. It explains why Pilate doesn't just tell Caiaphas, I don't care what you want, get out of here. He is afraid that he will actually incite a riot and then Pilate will be executed. 
So Pilate, the decision he ends up going with, ultimately, one of the things you see in him is you see he is as as frail and broken as you are because he ultimately chooses himself. When the choice is between him and Jesus, he is the choice. And be honest. Think about it. If you were in Pilate's shoes, could you honestly say you would have made a different decision? I know I would have, been, I would have said the same thing. And even especially, he doesn't even have the advantage of a Bible, the whole Bible to know what all happened. And so he knows, he's, I mean, he's basically getting thrusted in. He's probably heard about Jesus. I mean, he's given his job. He knows who he is. But he doesn't know enough to make a concrete decision as to who he is specifically, that he's the Christ. See, that is what we do. We do the same thing. We frequently are given the decision between our lives, ourselves, our kingdoms, and God's kingdom. We would preserve what is ours, what is mine, at all costs. This is why I believe that tomorrow, week from tomorrow, Maundy Thursday, is such a beautiful tradition, or a powerful one. At the end of the service, you're going to look up here, and we're going to have the candles removed, the altar book's going to be removed, the cloth, the, the pyramids, everything's going to be stripped. And all you're going to see is that bare wood. It's such a striking image. It's kind of almost a reminder of when you move out of a house for the, first, for the last time, or an apartment, or whatever, and you look at that room that was filled with your stuff for so long, and now it's just carpet and a wall. It's kind of that reminder of that one day, it's, for one, it's a reminder that Jesus, when he went to the cross, he was stripped. But it's also the reminder that what is yours, your kingdom, you don't get to take it with you. See, the entire season of Lent is all preparing you to die. Bondi Thursday is the staple, reminding you, you're going to one day have nothing. You can't take anything with you. You can't take your kingdom with you. And yet it is the thing that we serve so very much. If you ever want to see where your kingdom is, just look at your checkbook. Where is most of the money going to? What is, or just look at your schedule. Where are you spending most of your time? You don't have to look too long to find what is the thing that you will hold to. There's a circumstance in Jesus' ministry where this wealthy man comes up to Jesus. And the man says... Jesus, what must, or Rabbi, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, what are the commandments? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, well, I kept all these since my youth. Jesus says, and I understand I'm kind of paraphrasing, but Jesus says, there's one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the man walks away disappointed. Now, a lot of times people throughout the history have gotten that verse so horribly wrong. And they say, ah, so if you give everything you, go, you have to the poor, you, have, you are locked in to go to heaven. It's one of those things you've got to let context tell you everything. Remember, it began with the question, what must I do to be saved? And the man claimed he was keeping God's law. But when he was given a choice between giving up everything he has 
to give it to his neighbor or, you know, to give that up and have salvation or to keep everything he has and not have salvation. His choice was his wealth. And Jesus was showing that this man was a sinner. He was not keeping the law as he claimed because he loved his money so much that if he was, when he was given the choice between his wealth and eternity, he chose his wealth. And even more, he was willing to give it to others. And I have a feeling that's actually one of those things he could, t- Jesus could ask that to pretty much any American because every American is wealthy compared to the rest of the world. The very, just think about this. If you have a car, that alone makes you wealthy. See, we are in the same boat. We still want to preserve our kingdom above all else. But on Monday, Thursday, that altar is stripped. And after the altar is stripped, you hear the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words is Psalm 22. The same words that Jesus would utter from the cross. Because you see, Jesus be emptied him. He completely emptied himself. He became nothing. And he was abandoned by God the Father while on the cross. Why? So then your hour of death, when you leave everything, you won't be able to take your treasures with you. In your hour of death, you would not be abandoned. You would have God the Father. He would not turn his back on you. because He turned his back on his son so that he would never turn his back on you whom he has called and chosen as his child. See, Pilate let Jesus be crucified. He handed him over to preserve his kingdom, doing what we would do, doing something that we probably do in some shape or form all over and over. We choose our kingdom, choose our lives over Christ. But even through that sinful action of Pilate, God brought about salvation. He brought about the guarantee that when your kingdom, what you you have in this world, comes to an end, you will have a much greater kingdom. You will have the kingdom of God that does not end. It does not rust. It does not break away. When you are baptized, you are brought into that kingdom. When you hear the word, you receive that kingdom. When you receive the Lord's Supper, you taste and touch that kingdom. When we fail, when we fall, when we choose anything but other than God, which by the way, literally every single sin boils down to choosing something other than the one true God. When we fail, when we cave into sin, we are led, we are called to return to the Lord your God. Return to Him. And He says, on account of my son's death on the cross, your sins are forgiven. The kingdom is yours in Christ Jesus. Even for every time we choose elsewhere, he forgives it all. And in the end, the kingdom is his, is ours. And so, taste it. Receive it. And when you go out into the world, be a resident of that kingdom, proclaiming it to the world, to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.